Okay. All right, everybody. So we're back for the second part of uh, this week's uh, video lecture. Um, another note, another uh, video, and uh, actually he's a part of this uh, first chapter, the narrative portrait, um, page 31, narrative portrait 2, a white male reflects on privileges, on privilege. And uh, so it has... Uh, Actually, I know Tim Wise to some extent. Uh, we've emailed each other, and uh, he knows my background and uh, uh, him being a uh, you know white Southerner. My own self teaching classes on race and ethnicity in Detroit, which was uh, uh, really an enjoyable experience for me, and I think for my students as well. Um, but uh, I do I do know him, and and I do email and talk with him on, on, uh, every now and then. But I have a video uh, dealing with the topic of, of uh, privilege, white privilege. And uh, I think he's, he's one of the best, uh, I think he's one of the best anti-racist uh, uh, lecturers out there. And he, he has a way of doing it uh, that's quite convincing. And uh, he tries to, he, he's convincing in trying to show, show people that uh, uh, talking about white privilege, he's talking about the, uh, the if, if you're white uh, in ethnic background, uh, that uh, many times uh, because our, our group has been the dominant group historically and culturally, economically, uh, that there's a lot, that, there's a lot in our daily lives that we can take for granted. Uh, that that other people people of color are not able to take for granted, and uh, so that's what he means by this privilege, this unrecognized uh, privilege, not because of the kind of people we are, but simply because of our historical background, because of our av advantageous uh, position within within society, in terms of our uh, in terms of our eth ethnicity. Of course, you know there's also uh, Poor white people as well, and have experienced discrimination and prejudice, and, you know, and everything else in terms of their their social class background. But he talks about all this, and so I'm going to uh, upload also the video by uh, Tim Wise, uh, so you can also uh, uh, see him in person. Uh, very powerful uh, presenter, but he's also humorous as well. And uh, so we'll we'll also have that in in, in relation to the one on race. I'm going to load that one as well. Um, but anyway, uh, looking at the four, and here we're going to look at the, the key concepts in dominant minority relations. He points out the prejudice. If I draw it on a board, I'd put in a, like a, a four, uh, you know, like a four chart, four cells. And then we would discuss these. On one side, on the left side, I would have prejudice and discrimination. And at the top I would write uh, prejudice and discrimination happens at the everyday level. That's the everyday life that we live, right? at the individual person's level of everyday existence. On the right side would be uh, ideological racism and discrimination, especially institutional discrimination. And at the top there I would say these are social at the social, at the social wide level, at the macro level of society, they're beyond our everyday life. A race, uh, ideological racism, and institutional discrimination take place in another, uh, in another dimension, if you will. Uh, it's it's at the, it informs the whole society. It's not just at the everyday interactive level of individuals. And uh, so we look at both this micro and this macro, and how and how they're related. So when we think of prejudice, uh, the, the chapter says, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's two different levels. One is at the uh, thinking and feeling dimension, what we call cognitive prejudice. Uh, and that cognitive uh, prejudice, that thinking level, is based in the selective perception and the utilization of stereotypes. So if a person's been socialized to take on certain stereotypical views of uh, groups of people, uh, then that stereotype many times becomes subconscious 
and then selective perception is to select those features of our environment that help to support the stereotype and to exclude or see as a, an exception to the rule all of the uh, all the, the stimuli and the, the incoming flow of impressions, perceptions the, that may counter the stereotype. And what we do with those is we just shove those into the wayside not paying much attention or say, oh, that's just an exception to the rule. What what you mean by that is, yes, this person is a little different, but uh, my still my ideas about the, the whole group itself, my stereotype still remains. Very difficult to... Uh, there's, as we'll see when we get to the chapter on, on, on this, uh, that there's different types of prejudice. Uh, and some is harder to uh, overcome than others. Uh, just your everyday uh, sort of cultural prejudice, things that kids pick up along their, the way in school and in their families, uh, sort of what we call a cultural, it's, it's the prejudices that circulate in the culture, uh, can be remedied. And we know from research that uh, the best remedy for cultural prejudice is education. And so the statistics show that the higher the education of individuals, the lower the prejudice. The more educated, but also in terms of uh, coming in contact with people from other ethnic groups. The more physical contact we have, and especially if the, if the situation is not some competitive situation, tends to lower prejudice. The more we know a people and actually have experience interacting with other with people from other eth ethnic groups, uh, that tends to lower prejudice. Uh, and I'll talk some more about the, later on in the chapter, we'll talk about uh, the uh, social distance scale in, that deals with this notion of how, how distance we feel uh, from various ethnic groups, how close we are willing to come in contact or so uh, that'll be interesting but they have these two dimensions of prejudice one is thinking and feeling the other the other dimension dimension is uh, uh, is is affected so people can be also emotionally prejudiced uh, it can be something that that prejudice could be uh, obscure that is a person may feel Around certain people of a certain ethnic group, they may feel uncomfortable, they may feel fear, uh, they may feel loathing, or they may feel anger. Uh, nine times out of ten, a person that's, uh, that is uh, cognitively prejudiced will also be affected. There will be that feeling dimension. But th they don't have to go together. Uh, a person can be cognitively prejudiced against a group of people or groups of people and not harbor any ill feelings towards the group. They just have these stereotypes, right? Um, and conversely, a person could just have cogn uh, uh, affective prejudice. That is, they don't really harbor any ill thoughts or, or uh, prejudices, strong pre uh, strong stereotypes against the group, but they just have these, these negative feelings when they think about or when they're with uh, members of uh, certain ethnic groups. Uh, again, anger, fear, loathing. Uh, so they don't have to, to come together. But nine times out of ten, they do. There's a relationship. Uh, on the other side, discrimination and this is on the everyday level. Uh, individual discrimination. Discrimination is different from prejudice. Prejudice is an inward sense of uh, inward attitude, if you will, in, an inward state of being. Uh, discrimination is, a, is, is an action taken. So discriminatory behavior is an action you take against someone. Uh, it's a doing. So as it says in Exhibit 1.5, uh, prejudice is thinking and feeling, right? An inward state of uh, an inward state of uh, attitude and uh, state of being. Uh, prejudice is doing, uh, taking action. So the logic here is that um, you know a person can be prejudiced both cognitively and affectively all their lives and never discriminate against the the people they're 
they, they're prejudiced against. And uh, that's why it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, has, has prejudice been, is it being eliminated from society or is it lying lie dormant? Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell if people are prejudiced. Uh, even even this uh, notion of uh, uh, you know doing, for example, surveys among college students. And uh, generally, the more educated, the more the more they'll report uh, less prejudicial uh, views. Uh, but there can be an easy bias there. Do we are they saying what they're saying because they think that because of their education level they should say it, or is that really how they feel? We can't really. Uh, can't really uh, uh, test that. So, uh, you know, uh, it can be hidden. In, uh, you know, I think it's, I, I take more of the position that it lies dormant. That prejudice is always uh, an easy uh, way to uh, make quick summations about uh, events and people. And that, uh, Sometimes, for example, when there's economic downturn, scarce uh, job markets like we've been going through, prejudice tends, to, I think, to and shows history shows it increases uh, as a group contend as they compete over scarce the scarce resources of jobs. In good times, it may get more dormant. Right? And but on, on top of that, though, uh, uh, I would say as well that, that there's also been. The elimination of certain types of prejudice. Uh, you know, if you look back when, when I was a kid growing up in the 1950s, the stereotypes of African Americans at that time were terrible, almost laughable when we think about them today. Uh, in terms of their, you know, their their their, uh, their idiocy of their portraits and uh, just the extreme extremity of the extreme uh, uh, portrayals, caricatures if you will. Uh, and today it seems that that's changed a lot, that context is certainly there is less prejudice uh, thinking, uh, but there nonetheless. Uh, and uh, I, sometimes uh, we may say more, the more visible types of, or the more uh, blatant forms of uh, stereotypes have lessened to some degree though. You know, every, we've seen it rear, rear its ugly head again though, with the uh, election of Barack Obama, and the, you've seen those caricatures of him dressed up like a witch doctor from Africa and all these real racist uh, types of blatant forms of racial caricature, if you will. Uh, so it's still there, it lies dormant, but there has been, still there has been some positive changes as well. And a lot of prejudice can also, that we see today, can be even more subtle forms. Uh, people can uh, can have prejudicial views and not even be conscious of it uh, just by their perspectives on things uh, it's just something that's unchecked that goes that goes on it's very very uh, uh, subtle or not checked until until somebody calls you on it and then you can think about it and say oh yeah, yeah you're right about that you know didn't think about that I've seen that happen many times in my my experience um, so that's prejudice, and that's individual discrimination. On the other side, though, on the other side of the equation, uh, on the group and social level, again, on ex Exhibit 1.5 on page 28, ideological racism and institutional discrimination, again, are happening at the macro-wide, the society-wide level of society. It's not an everyday. It's not, it may inform the everyday, as it does. Uh, but it's something that's going on at the macro institutional level of, of society. So we reserve, for example, ideological racism. We kind of reserve that concept for certain uh, historical cases. So, for example, right now in our society, it would we'd be hard pressed to say that we live under ideological racism. Uh, when I was a child, when I was a young person growing up under the under the yoke of, uh, of segregation, racial segregation in the South, uh, that was ideological racism. And it was also, a bl and, and, and ideological racism, uh, and when we say ideological racism, what we mean by that is 
it's out on the cuff. Uh, and there's nothing subtle about it whatsoever. Uh, you know, it's in the laws, right? So schools will be segregated along racial lines. Uh, water fountains are, seg are segregated along racial lines. Uh, movie theaters are segregated along racial lines. Many other public places are segregated along racial lines. The schools are, uh, are segregated along racial lines. And it's all out on the cuff. Everybody knows it, right? It's in the laws. It says it right there on the law book that uh, this society is segregated along racial lines. And then you, when we say ideological, so that's racism. Your Racism is doing something negative towards a people along a perceived uh, racial inferiority, for example. Uh, ideological racism is, is that ideology is a systematic set of ideas that have to justify something. It gives justification for. So that's the ideological racism then has a direct relationship to, you see there, under group and social level, institutional discrimination. So especially uh, a blatant, what we call blatant form of institutional discrimination, such as slavery in the South, apartheid in South Africa, uh, the uh, um, segregation of the Jews and extermination of Jews in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, we can also see this in other in many other areas around the world. Uh, the institutional discrimination is blatant. So slavery, segregation along racial lines. Um, it's all written in the law books. It's a part of the policies of the, of the society. That's what we call institutional discrimination. Blatant form. It's not being hidden, it's not subtle, it's not indirect, it's right in your face. Well, to justify that, you need some set of ideas, especially if you're talking about uh, institutional blatant form along racial lines, racial segregation, or even slavery at, at its extreme, uh, then you're going to need uh, a systematic set of ideas about race that has to legitimate that social arrangement. Uh, so this is where you get a, a lot of the ideological racism, the systematic, uh, scientific, religious uh, tracts, for example, for pro-slavery tracts. You can go in some of your state big libraries and, and look up the pro-slavery uh, tracts. And uh, I've seen some of the uh, some of the original ones. That are, they're like a big tabletop book, if you will. This huge, mongous, uh, uh, like a table, like a tabletop book filled with uh, the latest scientific and religious moral rationales for the existence of slavery. We call it the pro-slavery tracts. And uh, the pro-slavery tracts, for example, grew up around the uh, uh, the counter, the opposite uh, emergent argument, which was the anti-slavery arguments, right? The anti, the uh, abolitionist uh, discourse. And as it grew stronger, uh, there were threatened interests, uh, especially among the planters of the South, and uh, and you know uh, their 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 uh, uh, you know their influences within the universities, the philosophy, and uh, the politics, and religious uh, figures uh, all came together and started producing these uh, pro-slavery arguments, and they, that became the the ideological uh, systematic. A thought on on based in race to make an argument why race why slavery was a good thing for African Americans why was what was positive to turn it into a positive idea if you will so uh, we see this then with the slave South we see ideological racism in Nazi the Nazi ideology was uh, in the end an ideological racism that was utilized to justify. Uh, in the end, the extermination, the attempt to uh, the Holocaust of, in relation to the Jews and other other groups uh, in in that society. Uh, without we see it with apartheid, as I said, and in, uh, and in other situations. So usually, these are extremely blatant. The societies steeped in a an extremely uh, blatant form of institutional discrimination. So then, uh, one of the uh, successes, for example, in the United States was with the uh, 
civil rights movement. And one of the uh, successes of the civil rights movement is that it broke the back of, uh, of this blatant form of institutional discrimination. Uh, Martin Luther King and uh, the other strategists within the movement, they knew they were not going to uh, solve all the problems in terms of individual prejudice and discrimination. They knew that was impossible. But they knew, as Martin Luther King said, if we, if we can change the laws, if we can get rid of this, uh, you know, this blatant institutional discrimination, these segregation, Jim Crow laws, if we can break that back, then, then we can start, um, we can dismantle this ideological racism, you know, which plays a function in, in legitimizing that uh, institutional arrangement. And uh, if we change that, that, that's something that's a good goal and that's something we can achieve. Uh, but uh, over time, then, then there are the expectations that over time, once those were dismantled, then uh, they could whittle away at uh, individual prejudice and discrimination over time which is a very complex relationship. Yes, it has, and yes, it hasn't. Uh, it's been successful for some and not successful for others, or, or uh, it's going along, uh, changing in a positive direction, and then there's things that go into, you know, happen in society, and society becomes more, uh, you know, a time of struggle with, with over scarce resources and prejudice rears its head again. And then we're, you know, back at looking at... Uh, you know, this this thing with uh, uh, these uh, voting rights uh, laws are being re-examined and uh, you know, the, the, the clause that uh, they could actually be uh, could changed if uh, if certain interests wanted to, to change it, right? And uh, so uh, it's a complex situation, complex relationship. I think what this teaches us, on one dimension, it, in studying these four dimensions and seeing how they interact, and, and as, as we look at uh, some of the different case studies, we'll see how uh, these four levels of analysis have uh, played out before for various groups. Uh, when you see that, then we, we can, as I say, that some things in society that society makes simple, this model makes complex. And some things that we tend to make complex in society, this model uh, makes simple for us. Um, so it's a really, a, it's really a, a, as you'll see as we go through the semester, very powerful uh, analytical tool to, to examine both uh, historically, culturally, and socially in looking at uh, the relationships and uh, uh, the development of social inequalities between groups along racial, ethnic, gender, and class lines. Uh, and we'll see more of this, uh, these four key concepts as we go. Uh, so I, uh, let me also encourage you on page 31 to go ahead and read uh, about Tim Wise, uh, sociologist, lecturer, writer, and anti-racist activist. And uh, they have a passage of his writing passage of his writings here. Uh, so go ahead and read, if you haven't read this, uh, go ahead and read that and I'm going to put his video lecture up on the board so you can see that and we'll do a discussion on that. And uh, also the uh, race is myth. Uh, there's, there actually there's a full length, uh, it's over, it's about an hour, and hour and a half, uh, long video that I show in my class. It used to be all there on, on the uh, YouTube, but now it seems that they, they've taken down the, the complete uh, program. But it's in segments. So I, I'm, I'm just going to put up a couple of what I think are the more insightful segments that get to the heart of the argument that's in that video. Uh, um, and uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that now. If Again, if you have any questions about the, the, this first chapter of the course, um, the upcoming exams, I'll be starting to, uh, as we go uh, into the uh, chapters, I will give you a really good review for your exam, the materials you'll need, the concepts you'll need to look at closer. I always give a good review. Uh, at least that's what students tell me anyway, that I give, that I give a good review for, uh, uh, overview for their exams. I don't, I don't leave you in the dark. Uh, main thing is to read your chapters all the way through 
they're not easy exams. They're, tr they're multiple choice uh, type and true false statement tests, but they're not easy tests. So you need to know your materials. If I, and, and so your first thing you got to do is read the chapters. You, you don't even have to take notes. Just read the chapters with interest. As I said before, the first five chapters are uh, a little bit abstract because he's dealing in theories. And then by chapter six, it's going to become historical material. And it's going to be mostly applying some of these uh, concepts, looking at the history in comparison of various groups. So we'll do that. Uh, read your chapters all the way through. Uh, you can listen to my, my short lecturettes. Uh, on, as we go, I'll do one, one of these or two of these for each chapter. And then when it gets close to test time, I'll give you a really good test review of what's going to be on the exam. You can go back again. The main, the main thing with the, this kind of course, a conceptually driven course in multiple choice, true, false kinds of exams is familiarity with the concepts. Get to know them. Make them your best friend if you can. Get to know them. Know examples of them. Uh, if you're like me, I'm a very tactical person. So uh, after I read a chapter, I would take a notebook, go back, and I would actually not read the uh, main points or the main concepts, I'd go back and write them down. And in that writing, it helps to cement these uh, ideas in my mind. And then also to be able to give a couple examples of uh, each concept so that you can, the main point here is that you're able to both recognize uh, the concept, but also to differentiate it from other concepts. And I think that's where sometimes students get into trouble with a multiple choice question is, uh, yes, you know that you know the concept, but you're not able to really different, differentiate it from other concepts. And in not being able to, you're not able to sometimes differentiate the examples that would fit underneath uh, the correct uh, concept. And uh, so you want to get to know your concepts well. And uh, so you're, that, just that initial reading the whole chapter through with interest. Uh, many times we subconsciously uh, take in information and then when you see it on a test, you can say, oh yeah, I remember reading that. I, I, know, I know the answer to this. Whereas the student that, uh, and this is one reason why I don't uh, really lie, rely on PowerPoints, the students will just rely on the PowerPoints and try to get the information that way and it doesn't work. Uh, they, they're just not able to, uh, to remember as well. Of course, you have somewhat of, an advantage uh, in that this is an online class, and certainly you're, you're going to use your books. And but you know, there's a there's not a large window of time to be spending time looking around for answers. Uh, I've had a student before who thought that that's what they should be doing. That it was all about looking up answers, and that really upset me because I'm not here for you to be looking up answers. I'm here for you to learn the material and to know the answers when the test time comes. And say you're not going to be able to pass the exams because you're not going to have enough time to be uh, running through the book looking for answers. Uh, certainly, it's there, and it, and it would be more fruitful if you already knew most of the material and if there was one or two things that uh, you needed to check because you kind of think you know the answer, but you want to check. Then, you know, possibly you may have enough time to do that with with a few questions. But if you go in there blind and you're just going to try to look up things, you're not going to pass the exam. So get to read the chapters and then you can go back and study the main uh, uh, points and the main concepts, get to know them. And then when I put my lecturettes up, you can, my short lectures, video, things I talk about, stress, you know, you can look at them closer and listen to what I say about them, get examples of the concepts, and then come test time, you can listen to my review, go back and study even closer certain areas. And if you do that, uh, I promise you, you'll, you'll do very, very well on your, on your exams. Also, we'll be talking about your paper project here in the very near future. So everybody have a great week. And uh, again, email me with any questions you might have. And uh, I'll be talking to you very shortly, uh, certainly on emails this week. And then next week, we'll do another video. All right, everybody have a good evening.